having a bit of computer trouble. So this is gonna be a handheld, but the amount of information here is some of the most valuable I've seen. One, Mr. Larry Fink, the most important and most probably influential person in the American economy, is currently, as of yesterday, calling crypto a flight to safety. We've always wondered, and this hasn't been the case that we've ever been able to test in a time of economic turmoil, of now international geopolitical turmoil, in a time where people are trying to get out of the markets, get to safe places, where will crypto fall? Is it going to be an exotic tech stock where these things are gonna get sold off and, and dumped to zero in times of turmoil? Or is it going to get protected in the, you know, the kingdom of safe assets, of safe havens, that being treasury bonds, historically, cash, historically. Uh, and then you also have things like gold. Is crypto, or Bitcoin at least at the beginning, eventually crypto, good cryptos, is that going to be an asset class that people want to be safe within? And that is something that right now, Larry Fink is promoting as yes. And here's the thing, you might think, oh, well, whatever, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. Once they get the go-ahead to actually sell Bitcoin products, which they're going to get, right? And there's a clip that he was just on Fox Business yesterday, less than 24 hours ago. And he said, he's not allowed to talk about the specifics when they asked him about you know some of the Bitcoin stuff. He's very specific because he knows there's a process happening and he knows the outcome of it. This is a question of, is it January? Is it March? Is it April? Is it even December? We don't know, but a Bitcoin ETF is coming and it is going to be a BlackRock Bitcoin ETF. And they are then going to promote this product to their clients, pure and simple. That is what's gonna happen. They will get their clients into Bitcoin. Fact, fact, okay? So the question is, what will the price of Bitcoin be in a time where we have the second piece of information, which is that Janet Yellen comes out yesterday and says, of course, America can afford to finance multiple wars at once. Well, let's take a look at the geopolitical chessboard. Uh, I did a video a few weeks ago or a week ago or so where I talked about how, you know, what I studied in college was actually Middle Eastern um, relationships, right? Middle Eastern politics. And um, I was on my way to law school. I didn't end up going to law school, though I was accepted with a full scholarship to one of the top 10 programs. Um, I ended up doing crypto instead, which I, is, has been a much better bet. Um, but at the same time, the, the, what I studied and what I learned was that effectively a lot of the things happening in the Middle East were ex, uh, expressions of tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It was positioning. The you know, Soviets were behind you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. They even tried to invade Afghanistan, etc. This isn't a history lesson. The point is, you have right now the same thing happening, where you have the Ukraine is now uh, sort of a proxy between the US and Russia. You now have the same sort of energy where, with Russia and China and these other nations that are on the other side of the geopolitical chessboard, taking the side of the countries that are against Israel. And then we can also see other conflicts with like Taiwan and China. Um, there's just a lot of conflicts that seem like they are moving from cold conflicts to hot conflicts across the, across the geopolitical spectrum. Now that is gonna cost a lot of money. And effectively the United States has a ton of debt compared to the amount of money that it produces, their GDP. Now the problem here is that everyone expects for this to be an explosion, something that explodes. And that just makes it so that uh, the, you know, the situation in America goes down to zero or there's some kind of massive crack. Now that might be the case, there, there might be an outlier chance. I don't think that that's gonna happen though, because in the end, countries, the business of running a country is effectively competitive with what else is out there, right? So if America and its economy is no longer desirable, then that would mean that money or that investors move to another more desirable economy, right? And that's just not the case, that doesn't exist. The biggest competitor out there is China and they are certainly in trouble as there are bank runs happening right now in China compare, uh, and this is a result of their Evergrande collapse, of their real estate collapse that has been really picking up steam of late because they have other different companies besides Evergrande that are in trouble, right? They had essentially this era where they just financed every single real estate uh, development and now there are cities of empty buildings getting demolished because it's cheaper to demolish them than to let them rot or whatever the heck. So what you see here is a reset in China where they tried to cut rates to zero and, and inject a ton of stimulus and it didn't, it didn't help. So this whole bank run thing happening in China seems like it's going to continue. And it makes it so that the biggest competitor to the American economy, the American way of life, is not really a competitor at all, right? The biggest competitor to the American currency uh, is maybe this BRICS currency or maybe the, the Chinese yuan, maybe you have other currencies, but not really, not really. 
So you have this facade, right? And you say, okay, well, the, Amer the Americans can't finance a war because of their ratio, the ratio of debt to GDP. Well, there's a few ways to fix that ratio. You either increase productivity uh, with new technologies or have population growth, just more people, more things being produced, or um, you also have, and by the way, maybe this is some reason that they're having this open border policy where people are just flooding into the United States. They just need more people to, and eventually maybe the logic is that that increases the economy and the GDP. But then there's also uh, another way, which is that you can create a ton of inflation where effectively you debase the value of the dollar and then it's painful short term, but eventually prices just grow and wages grow too. So think about it this way. A sandwich shop is selling sandwiches for 10 bucks. Eventually, and by the way, a $10 sandwich used to be insanely expensive. Now it sounds normal. Um, now, eventually it moves to 12, 15, and 20 bucks. So they, they still sell 100 sandwiches a day, but instead of making 100 times 10 bucks, they make 100 times 20 bucks. So the GDP of that sandwich shop grows with inflation. And eventually, if you do this right, like they did after World War II and after other periods of high inflation in the United States, the GDP uh, to debt ratio normalizes and actually gets better into a better situation, right? So the actual ratio of the amount of money owed to the amount of money that is created or being, or being generated uh, normalizes more. And I believe that that's the long-term hope for what would happen if the United States is to finance these wars. Short term, we're going to see a lot of inflation. Now, of course, throughout this whole period, if you could have something that was, you know, like property, gold, something that was actually going to hold its value versus the original dollar, well, that's the real trick. And that's where you get this narrative for Bitcoin, which is cool. We have this path over the course of maybe many years or several years to get it to the point where normal people can afford their lives working at a sandwich shop or whatever it might be. In, in the United States, um, where right now it's really painful month to month. And that path is, you know, not a, it's not super simple, but there's a path there where, yes, they can afford these wars, they finance, they end up creating some inflation. That inflation eventually brings the ratio of debt to GDP down. And so effectively, the United States can end up better off through the process of inflation. But the one thing that anyone would realize is that if you're just saving and hoarding US dollars, you're the one who pays the price. So the question is what happens here and how do you sort of predict around this? And of course we see Bitcoin and its moment could be now. That doesn't mean that you have to have this apocalyptic scenario for the US economy. <clears throat> Sorry, um, you don't need to necessarily have this apocalyptic moment for the US economy. So um, hopefully, this is my hope by the way, um, there could be a really negative outcome, but I'm also being very sensitive that you don't wanna become a, a, a cataclysmic doomer here on the American economy because the competitors are terrible absolutely terrible. Now, the things we have to ab absolutely make sure don't happen is the uh, implementation of a CBDC, which is certainly what they're trying to do, what they want to do. Um, and that allows for things like speech or news or information that's shared that's not convenient for the government to get turned off. And we see them trying to do that kind of stuff right now. The Supreme Court is defending our rights to real information and free speech. Uh, but as recently as literally right now, they're trying to censor what is being said about you know wars, conflict, the economy. And in a world of a CBDC, that's really easy. They don't need to go to Facebook or Twitter. They just say, oh, we don't like this post off. You can't, Apple Pay doesn't work. Oops, can't get your groceries. Whoops, you don't have a place to live. That is a scary world. That's a scary world. That's the world that nobody wants to live in and, uh, and allows for really bad stuff to happen. Um, and so short, short of that, which I believe we should all have as a priority in these restructurings going on, we should just be very aware that the competitors of the United States government are not very attractive. So there is a world in which America creates a new era powered by AI and new innovations and nuclear power and all this cool stuff that we have on the horizon um, and that we create a new era of prosperity. However, getting there might be sticky and there will most likely be some serious inflation. So understanding that hedging against that inflation is really, really important. And that's where this Bitcoin narrative comes in. And Larry Fink, Mr. Larry, coming in and saying that crypto is a flight to quality shows where he's planting his flag and building a narrative. Remember, the best investments aren't just things, they're stories. Think about Tesla, the story of Tesla, the, the, the far reaching implications of what they're doing. Much more ex exciting than just how many cars they sold. It's about the batteries, the solar power, the transition of the human race, right? That is a massive story. Right. And so the story that's being told about Bitcoin now from the most trusted man on Wall Street, the, the guy who's really pulling the strings, it's huge. It's huge. Can the can the America finance this this war, these two wars? Probably, probably. Actually, that's the thing is they probably can. 
but you're going to want to understand that it's going to create a lot of inflation. So uh, that's my take on it. I hope this video is very, very helpful because Bitcoin being spun as a, as a safety narrative while we're having international conflicts, that's going to allow for a lot of savvy investors, a lot of BlackRock clients to do very well over the coming years. Of course, the wealth gap will continue to grow. Again, this is not something you can be stopped. That can be stopped. We're not going to go into all that, but I hope this video has helped you. If you did, if you did get some value, smash that like button. If you didn't like it, hit that dislike button. Please show me how much you dislike the video. Uh, as always, I'm Elio Trades. Uh, there's another video popping up. It's awesome, and I'll see you very soon in the next episode. Bye.